Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More. And today in Tube Lab number 105, we're going to do another episode on how to achieve great sound. And this will be part one of bass. I'm saying it's part one right away because this is a huge subject and it's going to take a number of episodes for us to sort this thing out. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. What's the number one question we get? Well, can you recommend some great sounding vintage tubes for my new amp? And I love those questions. <laughs> Okay, everyone could have get, figured that one out. But what's the number two question? Well, what tubes will improve my bass? Well, to answer that question, we've also got to answer what affects bass. And that's going to take a while. So, first of all, what is bass? Sure, everyone knows it's those very low notes that when you turn it up, the sound goes thumpa thumpa. In fact, I learned that the hard way. I remember finding a huge subwoofer on the side of the road. I scurried home, grabbed our dolly, and raced back to my treasure. I hooked that huge monster up to our home theater receiver, and that night we watched Master and Commander. Well, when the first cannon shot went off, all I could say was, holy dot dot dot, it was like that damn cannon was in our listening room, and I immediately had a vision of our landlady typing out a text message, which we received the next morning. <laughs> I had the monster sub gone by the afternoon. When you've got two women in your life telling you to get rid of that thing, it's gone. Anyways, there's no point in fighting it. And I didn't. Okay, so let's get some cards out to help help represent what we're talking about. Okay, so first of all, a bass note or bass frequency is a very long, low wave. And this is what it would look like on an oscilloscope, or typically called a scope. And someday maybe we'll get the scope going and show you a bunch of frequencies. It's really instructive. So it's a very slow, long wave, and it'll show up very flat like this on the scope. We're talking roughly 10 hertz to 150 hertz. At 150 hertz, we're starting to get into what's called the mid bass. And mid bass, of course, is between the bass and the mid range. Next, we've got mid range. And it's a much quicker signal. It would run, let's say, roughly 150 hertz to 1000 hertz. Now, you can shorten 1000 hertz to 1 kilohertz or 1K. And last, we've got the treble, and it's a very, very fast frequency. And this is how it would show up on the scope. Pardon my, I, I couldn't do the, the little squiggly lines neatly. This is not exactly how it shows up on the scope. <laughs> Charles is over there wondering what kind of artist he's got for a dad. But anyways, he doesn't. Um, so, treble run, runs roughly 1,000 uh, hertz to 20,000 hertz, or 1K to 20k. In the old days when I was a very young lad and a budding audiophile, we would talk about specs being 20 to 20 on a good on a good system. So it would be 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And I think that still holds true today. Um, though we're a little more ambitious in the low end than we were when I was young. Okay, let's get some more cards going. Let's just put this over here. Let's back up a little bit. Okay, so we've got the recording. That's number one on your effect on your bass. If the recording doesn't have the bass recorded properly, or they filtered it out, and I would say close to, yeah, I would say 90% of all records, LPs, uh, vinyl, um, they, they filter the bottom end aggressively, and that really makes a lot of vinyl sound anemic. It's unfortunate. The reason for that, of course, is that if they put too much low end into the pressing, 
the needle can actually be jumped right out. The needle the stylus will follow high frequencies without a problem. Those low frequencies are a big problem, even with the RIAA curve. Okay, um, so recording, absolutely important. Next, let's say we've got a preamp in our system. And, you know, we've got some sort of source. It can be, it can be a turntable, it can be a digital player, whatever. Now, with the preamp, you're typically going to have voltage gain tubes, and they will affect the sound. Tu preamp tubes will have an impact, and the biggest difference you'll hear isn't whether they'll go low or not. That's more dependent on whether it was actually recorded in the first place. The biggest difference will be clarity, definition. That can be huge with preamp tubes. The good news is that the better vintage tubes, like the Sony's, uh, Sony's, I was listening to a recording uh, remastered by Sony, so I got Sony on the brain, um, and we'll probably talk about that in a minute. But no, Sylvania 6SN7s, the Tungsol 6SN7s, Charles is going to look at some tongues later on uh, for new arrivals. Um, RCAs, uh, tubes like that, they have good bass. They'll, they'll be a little different from each other, but they'll all have good bass. The, the, the mediocre uh, voltage gain 6SN7s, 12AU7s, they will have bass, but it'll be well, less well-defined. It'll be muddy, sloppy. Uh, it'll not be nice. Okay, what about your power amp? What difference does that make? Well, power amp is huge when it comes to bass because the bass notes are hard to amplify. They need power. So the bigger your power amp, whether it's a tube or solid state, the better your bass is going to be as a general rule. The bad news is that the bigger your power amp, the more expensive it is, the more power it uses, the hotter it gets, the heavier it is, the harder it is to move, the more expensive it is. To <laughs> Did I say that once? It's worth saying twice. So, uh, you know, there's no perfect world. Speakers, huge for bass absolutely huge. If you don't have good speakers um, that can handle the low frequencies, and most can't. Most will have little tiny, you know, anemic little bass drivers. Forget about that. You're not going to get any low frequency response from that. It, you know, it'll cut off at 50, 60, 70, 80 hertz. Um, what about the room, Jim? Well, yes. The room, let me see if I can get all our cards rearranged so you can actually see the room. The room is huge. In fact, if I was to rank the effects on bass reproduction, here's the list. Number one is the recording. Absolutely. Number two is the speakers. Number three, believe it or not, is the room and the decor in the room. The decor just means your furniture, your drapes. Uh, and it should include um, windows. Windows are terrible for reflections. And we'll talk more about the reflections and stuff that probably in another episode. Output transformers. Uh, on tube gear, on a tube app, the output transformers really, they need to be good quality. You're not going to get low frequency reproduction. doesn't matter how good anything else is. What about the power tubes? This is actually the GU50. And we'll talk about that in a minute, probably. Uh, I love talking about new prototype amps. And the GU50, oh my god, um, it's, it's been fantastic. Uh, anyways, I digress. Power tubes are really important. The better power tubes, generally speaking, will give you good bass. Um, and if you're a, a real bass hound, if you love bass, you're going to like the big, powerful tubes, like the KT88, the lesser uh, powered 6550 as well. Um, the GU50 is fabulous for bass. It is an amazing tube for bass. Um, and it's a beam powered pentode. Now, the KT80 type are tetrodes, and there's a difference. Every doesn't mean they're necessarily better than each other, but every tube type has a particular sound. And the interesting thing about pentodes is. Um, 
And think about the EL-34 as one of the most famous pentodes, and of course the Mullard is the most famous of the famous types, um, tends to have a warm, rich sound, whereas the KT-88 type, types tend to have this driving, hard sound that's very fast. So for bass hounds, they'll probably prefer the KT-88 type, but if you're listening to um, acoustic music, particularly jazz, new world jazz like I love, um, uh, avant-garde um, fusion music, you're probably going to be in an EL-34 type or a pentode. That's where this GU-50 comes in and it's really exciting because it's a beam-powered pentode. So it's not a beam-powered tetrode. Uh, and there'll be a lot more discussion about that too because it's just blowing me away. <laughs> what about you, Charles? Yeah, yeah, it sounds fantastic. Okay, so what else is left to think about? Well, the circuit design and the components can affect the bass as well. We design for a very wide band reproduction. We don't filter or cut off the low frequencies anywhere. We send everything through um, our kit amps that we can. So long as it doesn't cause a problem downstream, we put it in. Even if we lose some efficiency at the power stage, at the power amp stage, because we've got a lot of very low frequencies, I don't care because the bass reproduction of all of our kit amps sounds amazing. And it's the best bass I've ever heard of any amp. Now I'm not saying it's got the most power or forward sound, what it's got is the best clarity and realistic sound. And for a critical listener like me and many audiophiles, that's much more important than a forward thumpa thumpa sound. Um, so, what's left? Well, we've got to talk about reflections, and that's a huge subject, and we'll probably do that another time. Speaker placement is huge as well. So we'll probably do that in part two. Okay, so hopefully that was a good starting point to start to understand what affects bass. Yes, the tubes matter, every, but everything matters, and many things matter more than the tubes. Okay, Charles, what's been going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, we've continued development on the GU50, and we've been doing a lot of cr critical listening of it. Uh, as we just talked about, and uh, it's just blowing us away in absolutely everything that we've put through it. Yeah, in fact, uh, what gave me the idea for this episode was, well, it was an email from a customer talking about bass, or asking about bass, but I had on one of my favorite soundtracks, Brown Bunny. Now, the film is controversial, and I've never seen it, and honestly, I don't want to, but the soundtrack is, it's dark, it's... Um, it's definitely um, fusion. It's hard to define what it is. If you like uh, world jazz and you like uh, fusion, fusion is a crossover between rock and jazz, and you enjoy uh, movie soundtracks, which can be eclectic sort of in nature, you will love Brown Bunny. Anyways, Brown Bunny has got this sort of dark tone to it. And on the GU50, uh, kid amp. Wow! It was, it was like a different soundtrack. And I started thinking about what tracks do I have that have bass on it, and that sort of led to this whole discussion. So when I was young, one of my favorite films, talking about another favorite film, was Cha Cha. Now this was post-punk, uh, new wave, um, German new wave, uh, it had Hermann Brood, it had Nina Hagen in it, it had uh, Lena Lovage. And Lena Lovage has a song that they do in the film. They do it live, and it's got an opening bass line. Uh, what's the song called? Home, right. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to put that up onto uh, the GU50 system and see how that opening bass line sounds? Because my memory as a kid in the theater was, wow, that, that just thumped me right out of my seat. And lo and behold, I found three different versions of it, uh, put it up into our system, and they sound, except for one of them, they sound flat, 
They found sound poorly recorded. I think the theater had a better copy. <laughs> well, that copy actually, believe it or not, was that soundtrack was laid onto the film. Mm -hmm. So it's encoded. And it was so old ago, it was, long ago, it was probably a magnetically encoded layer on the side of the film. So it would have been like tape then. It would have been like tape. High speed tape, because film, of course, moves quite quickly. But anyways, obviously the original album, which we listened to, did not have um, that level of definition. Uh, and it, one of the recordings was as bad. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is this probably is the starting point of great bass, is finding good recordings. And it makes a huge difference. It can be a bit of a challenge sometimes, but it's definitely worth it to look around for, for something good. And sometimes a better pressing or a better recording can make a huge difference as well. Okay. Now, uh, something else did happen while you, we were listening to oh. the GU-50, though. Oh, yeah. That's right. I almost forgot. Oh, well, we had one of them suddenly turn off. And that led us down a whole interesting rabbit road with the development. I think it's rabbit holes. Rabbit, <laughs> rabbit hole, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who goes down a road? Yeah. I don't know. Anyways. So what ended up happening is that we blew a fuse. And this is the first time it's happened. We've been listening to them for a while. And it and had it, us questioning what was going on exactly. And it blew it on build number one, which is the oldest build. Because, mm -hmm. of course, I built a second channel. And at that point, I started to think maybe there's a startup surge that we haven't taken into account. There's always, when you start a fairly big amp like the GU50 or any piece of audio equipment, there's normally a startup surge as the capacitors load up and the circuit gets going. And it can be quite large, but I wasn't sure how large the GU50 was. So I, I built a custom cable that would tap the high would tap the hot leg, we put it through a meter, and lo and behold, the regular idle current of the GU50 was, how much was it, Charles? Somewhere around 600 milliamps, which is not bad. No, but what was the surge? The surge was all the way up at around 1.3 amps, or 1,300 milliamps. Right, so over twice the amount our primary fuse was rated at one amp slow blow, so it lasted actually for hours and hours of listening, days and days of turning on and off, and then it popped. So, with that in mind, of course, I mean, this is why we, we basically, we run in or work in the prototypes so we can discover if there's any issue with the specification. So up the fuse rating went to 2 amps slow blow. And of course, that'll be perfectly fine forever in a day, unless you have a, a short. And which... then it'll blow like it's supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, you've got some tubes to show people. I do. So let me clear the decks for you here. Okay, the table's all yours. All right, so we had some beautiful tongue saws come in. We've got a couple of different boxes here and a couple of different versions of the tube. Let's take a quick look at these guys here. This, let's get these on camera. So this, you can see this box is a little bit longer than that one. And it's got this great label on here. Uh, I don't know when the last time was that you could get a Tung Sol 6SN7 for, oh, there we go, for $2.70 from Bucks, but um, I wish those days were back. <laughs> Or we had a time machine. Or a time machine, yeah. We'd go with suitcases. Actually, if we had a time machine, we'd go with containers. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Tung Sol 6SN7 GTB standard bottle. And we call it the standard bottle because there's a tall bottle version of the tube. And this is about average here. Sorry, I'm trying to keep this in frame here and give you a good look at the tube. They're nice looking tubes. Um, and they're pretty easy to spot and make out. And I'm going to talk a little bit about their plate structure in a minute here. But the the defining feature of tongue saws are these really spiky micas. You can kind of see how they, they cut in and they come out quite strong compared to most other tubes. And they're made with either these halo getters or a horseshoe getter, which we'll see on the other tube here in a second. But that makes these easy to spot. Uh, there are occasional rebrands of these tubes. There aren't a lot of them, but there also aren't a lot of tongue saws floating around. But that makes it easier to see. 
Here's the box for the second tube. It's fairly standard, but they're nice looking boxes. Matches the nice tube that's on the inside. Let's go in the other way. There we are. And here's the tall bottle version. Let's compare them side by side here so you can get an idea. There we are. See, so it's a, it's a fair bit taller, but the internals are identical. And you can see really the only difference is that the getter holder is a little bit higher. And in terms of sound, they're practically the same as well, I think. Well, in fact, I did a listening test. Uh, we got a whole bunch of the standard bottles in, and I thought I'd better do some serious critical listening. And I, I, on the set I was listening to, I thought they actually had an edge on the tall bottle. Oh, okay. But either way, they're both great sounding tubes. And you can see this one has that neat horseshoe getter in there. But otherwise, the plate structure, the micas, they are all identical on them. So let's take a look at something that's similar to these tubes here. So one of the more common tubes that you're going to see with that same plate structure is, of course, the Sylvania. And they had a GTA and a GTB version of, of the tube with this plate structure, the angle T plates. But what a lot of people don't know is that there's a difference between the plate structure of the Sylvania and the tongue saw. And I'll try and point it out here. It's subtle. It might be difficult to see on camera, but let's see if we can, we can point it out here. The biggest difference you're going to see is that the tongue saws are much better boxier along the edges, along these creases, compared to this more gradual curve to the Sylvania. And they also have these extra two support ribs along the side of the plate where the Sylvanias don't. So that's an easy way to differentiate them. You can also see right away these micas are quite a bit different, although Sylvania typically use that same big halo getter. What about this guy right here? Well, let's compare it to the tongue saw. But this is a CBS branded tube and has those same angle T plates. They're pretty similar and they're close to the tongue cells, but they are slightly different. They have the extra support rib and they're a little bit boxier than the Sylvanias, but not quite the same. But clearly the micas are very different and CBS tended to make them in these very, very short bottles. And um, we're not sure exactly where these were made, but it was likely the, was it the Hytron? The, ori the original plant was the Hytron plant and CBS purchased um, a lot of tubes under contract with Hytron and then eventually they bought out Hytron. Mm -hmm. And you'll often see CBS tubes labeled CBS Hytron. Yeah. And then the later tubes are just labeled CBS. Yeah, so I mean, they're nice looking tubes, they're, they're rare, they're, um, they're great sounding as well, but there are slight differences between these and the tongue saws, and that should help you pick them out. So we just got in a number of these, a new old stock and used, and they're in the store right now if you're interested in them. Yeah, the tongue saws are one of our hottest sellers. Almost as soon as we get nice tongues in, out, back out they go. <laughs> and I can't blame people, I mean, tongue saws have a level of detail that is just unbelievable. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, the level of detail is just amazing on them. And speaking of detail, we've got another tube to take a look at here. I'm just gonna get these safely out of the way. You don't wanna drop a tongue on the floor. <laughs> no. So, in keeping with our recent videos, we're gonna be offering another weekly sale on a tube that we find interesting. And this is the RCA. 6SN7 GTB. It's the tall bottle version with the short base. And let me get in here so you can get a good look at those at the tube. It's got a bottom getter. You don't typically see much chrome, if any at all, in these tubes, but they, they test great and I think it just has to do with the material that they were using. And they have those typical RCA ladder plates, which they used in almost every one of their tubes, I think. And they did an awful lot of rebranding for equipment manufacturers. It was a very, very common tube. It's rebranded at least as much as the Marconi uh, version. At least as much. We have tons of them. You see them from Westinghouse and Sylvania even rebranded them. And, and Stark, which was a, an equipment manufacturer at the time, had tons of these rebranded. So what's the deal in the store, Charles? So the deal is um, 
I believe they are going to be $15 off, so we're selling them for $35 now over the next week. And there's a number of matched pairs available if you're interested in them. But we did some critical listening of this tube, and it has really nice clarity in the mid and upper range. And great detail in the base, but the base also had a little bit of something extra to it. And in, the, in our critical listening of other RCA tubes, we like to describe the mid-range as having sort of a smooth, buttery sound to it. And I feel like that was kind of pushed down into the bass range a little bit. It had a little bit of something extra there. But if you're looking for something with great clarity on a budget, this is a good tube for you. Excellent. Okay, well thanks for doing that, Charles. Okay, well, if you stay till the end, we have, remember we have flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if yours is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us. And of course, all the standard discount codes apply, including a secret one that some of you are picking up on and you're costing us big money. Anyways, I always like to see customers getting discounts. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.